my name is Mandan Kaur and I'm an Ashoka Young Changemaker. I'm super excited to be here today with Oscar from We Count. Oscar, thank you so much for joining us. Can you start by telling me a little bit about We Count and the work that you do? Sure, and, and first, thank you so much for, for having me and inviting me into this space. Um, so my name is Oscar Londoño. I'm the executive director of We Count. Uh, we Count has uh, been in existence since 2006 in a place called Homestead in Florida. Uh, we're a membership-based organization that advocates for the rights of low-wage workers and immigrant families. And so our members are farm workers, day laborers, domestic workers, and plant nursery workers. And together we're organizing for fair jobs and papers for all. That's awesome. And you've been distributing a lot of funds and support during the COVID pandemic. So can you tell me a little bit about what inspired you to get involved? Sure. So in, in March, when we saw the pandemic start to really um, grow exponentially, we knew that the public health crisis was going to create an imminent financial crisis as well. And so we began getting calls and messages from concerned members, you know, workers in the community who were seeing less jobs. So domestic workers who were being told, don't return to work, uh, day laborers who were waiting out in the corners and weren't finding enough jobs to be able to secure stable wages. And so once we knew that there was going to be this financial crisis, uh, we decided to create a mutual aid fund uh, with the idea of providing direct financial relief to workers so that they could cover um, basic financial needs, whether it's a portion of their rent, housing, food costs, medical costs, or some kind of bill. Um, and then once we realized that the federal government had excluded them from, from relief um, and from the CARES Act, we saw that it was that much more important to continue doing the fund, given that so many uh, were and, and continue to be in crisis. Absolutely. And what sort of response have you been getting from the people that you've helped? So, you know, it's been a, a really interesting learning process. I think from the beginning, we knew that we could never replace the state, right, uh, or the role of government that you know, we're a small organization doing our best uh, to fill a gap. And, and so within a week of launching the application, we got hundreds of applications, uh, much more than we could actually help. Um, but so far in about two months, we've been able to distribute upwards of 80 to $90,000 uh, wow, to hundreds of families. Awesome. Um, and the reception has been great. You know, workers understand that this small uh, bit of financial relief can possibly cover every possible need, right? right? But the idea is that, you know, we really stepped in because government stepped out and they see it as an act of solidarity, as an act of understanding that even in moments of crisis, communities and organizations can step up and take care of each other. That's beautiful. And what was the process like? So it's March and the pandemic is hitting. How did you pivot your organization to focus on the relief? Yeah, so our organization is really focused on organizing and advocacy, right? We understand that programs like direct relief, um, incredibly important to meeting the material conditions of people who are often living in poverty and hardship under compounding uh, sort of dimensions of oppression. Uh, but our focus is really on how do we build the power of low-wage immigrant workers to do structural transformation of the social, economic, and political systems that make poverty inequality of opportunity possible, right? And so for us, it was an interesting decision to pivot to, uh, to direct aid and to mutual aid fund. Uh, because for us, you know, we understood that that would mean months of us administering a fund and essentially having to field a lot of calls, a lot of emails, a lot of applications from people who historically may not have been connected to the organization, who may have been hearing about us for the first time, um, and whose entry point into our organization was from a moment of crisis, right? Um, but we, we felt it was important uh, as an act of solidarity uh, to stand in that moment and to pivot our work, even if you know, we're still evaluating um, how to continue sort of building upon that and how to make sure that we're not just providing relief, but that we're also addressing the structural conditions of inequity. Absolutely. And what was the role of collaboration and teamwork in helping you make this pivot and then distribute all this money? Yeah, so uh, we partnered with a lot of organizations locally uh, and statewide that began uh, spreading the word to um, their members or to their friends or their neighbors about this fund. Um, we got a lot of you know individual donors who decided to pledge their stimulus check. So there was a beautiful act of solidarity when the stimulus check came in 
that many people decided, you know, I may not need this. I don't have this kind of financial crunch. And so let me actually redistribute that stimulus check to someone who's undocumented, someone without paper, someone who might need it a little bit more. Um, and so there was, I think, a, bureau, a beautiful um, movement of, of individual supporters, individual donors, and of course, volunteers, people who maybe didn't have funds to share, but then instead also volunteered their time, volunteered um, donating non-perishable food items, PPE, anything that they could provide in that moment, even if it wasn't funding. Wow. So can you also tell me then about the power of community during a time like this and having that solidarity? Yeah, I think this, this moment, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has really shifted a lot of people's understanding of the importance of workers and the importance of people who often live in the margins, right? And it's made very clear the connection between um, how much value and respect and dignity we afford, say, the farm worker and how that affects our food supply chain and our own uh, lived experience. And so it's been a moment, I think, of shifting a lot of people's consciousness. A lot of people have stepped up. Maybe they never um, were involved in a political activity. Maybe they never donated to a nonprofit organization. But this moment, I think, has revealed a lot of the, uh, the cracks of, of our government and of our economy. And, and I think it's been a moment of people really stepping up like they do in, in different kinds of crises. Um, at the same time, I think it's, it's still left to be, to be uh, discovered whether what follows this will be uh, a moment of real transformation or just the further entrenchment of, of inequalities. Absolutely. And what do you hope that future transformation could look like? So I think, you know, um, even before this COVID-19 pandemic, people were already living in crisis, right? Um, the pandemic simply exacerbated a lot of crises in our communities. People were already suffering from an affordable housing crisis. They couldn't afford the rent. They were being gentrified and displaced from their communities. Workers were working on the job for meager wages. Uh, many, including farm workers, were still working in hazardous conditions and unsanitary conditions. And so what this pandemic has made clear is that you know, long before this hit, um, a lot of people were living paycheck to paycheck and were one emergency away from financial disaster. And um, this pandemic simply has increased the scope of people who understand the precarity of their situation as workers, as renters, um, as a working class. And, and my hope is that what we win beyond this moment is an understanding that we need to you know, drastically reform our social, economic, and political system to really center the needs of working people who have been living in crisis, but who even throughout this crisis have been producing so much of the value, so much of the wealth, so much of the possibility of recovery through their labor. And as an organization, what are you trying to do to ensure that that message is lasting? So we're a membership-based organization. We, we value that. You know, at the core of our work is an understanding that movements should be directly led by people who are affected by these problems. And so our membership are low-wage immigrant workers, some with status, some without status, many of them living in precarity, uh, who take active roles over our organization, who decide the agenda of the organization, and then who also occupy our board of directors. So our board of directors is all consumed by people who come from our membership base, because we understand that our, our movement will only be as strong as the engagement and the leadership of directly impacted people. And what we hope to simply create as, as, as an organization uh, at WeCount is a political home where people who are low-wage immigrant workers can come in and find that shared space of capacity building, of campaigning, of political education, and fight um, through self-determination and through campaigning to improve their lives and the lives of their coworkers. That's really beautiful. And what advice would you give to other young people who want to step up right now and make a change? So I think, you know, with all the different currents that we're seeing um, in national movements and global movements, you know, we understand that a historical study of movements tells us that young people have always been at the core, right, of social change, have always been pushing the boundaries of our political imagination. And I think the same thing is true now, right? People are, young people are the ones organizing massive demonstrations, organizing mutual aid networks, figuring out a way of shifting the consciousness of their parents, of their friends, of their neighbors, of their classmates. And so I think for young people, it's to 
reinvest in the process of building organizations, of joining organizations that are that are political, that are morally sharp, and that are really fighting for um, an economy that's inclusive, that's just, and that's fair for all of us. Incredible. Well, thank you so much for uh, what you're doing for the community and for sharing your story today. I'm really inspired. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate the, the work that you're doing to really highlight these stories during this very difficult, but I think a time of, of a lot of transformation that hopefully will produce um, uh, a better world.